Hello, everyone, and welcome to join me on this little recording where we will be having a look uh, through some of the material actually from our earlier meeting. Uh, we normally have these live online meetings on Thursdays in the morning and then another one in the evening. But this week, unfortunately, we needed to kind of move things around because of a few other college commitments and we had scheduled it for the Friday. And unfortunately, and I guess I should say not unfortunately as well, another very uh, valuable and important uh, college commitment came up. And for that reason, I had to be there on the Friday as well. So just for the sake of completeness and for making sure that I'm providing all of these sessions, I wanted to provide this as well, even though it might come a little bit after the fact, uh, but just to make sure that you do have a kind of a condensed version of the material to refer back to as well. And on that note, I'm going to share now my screen um, and we will go through some of the key points of the urinary system. As always, I offer in a class one of these uh, summary sheets that really nicely highlights the key points of the, each chapter. And uh, we typically in a classroom go through these together and I provide the answers for those. However, like I said, I don't normally do it online in this setting. So if you did not get a chance to get a copy of this, uh, this um, summary sheet or get a copy of the answers, all you have to do is knock on my shoulder during the class time and we'll make sure that you get that resource as well. But like I've said in the past, that's a completely optional resource that some find useful and uh, I don't expect you to return it or anything like that. And on that note, what you should be seeing either now immediately or at least in a few moments time is going to be a copy of a presentation that I used in the classroom. And like I said, we'll use this as the skeletons for some of the most important concepts. Uh, the full story is going to be available for you in the full lecture recordings, which I do offer on the Canvas course as well. So you know that I'm always trying to think of how to tie these chapters together and how to make this coherent story of systems interactions and so on. And to start that, I wanted to bring us back to something that we've seen before. And uh, I've referred to this formula a few times in the class, and I'm certain that you recall it from your Bio 181 or Bio 156 classes. And this formula itself, I would never ask you to memorize it, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time for us to try to more of the memorize, make sense out of it, and why it is so important in explaining what we are really doing with these different systems and what these different systems offer for us. So what we see is basically simply the formula for cellular respiration. So you remember in the process of cellular respiration, and this is not a complete formula, this is a kind of a shorthand version of it. In the process of cellular respiration, I really should have added here also the oxygen. That looks better. Uh, in the process of cellular respiration, we took sugars. So what we have here is the formula for glucose. We, of course, also needed oxygen if we did uh, cellular respiration that was aerobic. And that gets converted into the energy on a cellular level, which was, of course, our ATP. ATP was the driving force behind the cell level events and so on. And um, we saw 
that that was important. That was what all the cells, all the cell functions that we were going to look at relied on. So oxygen, we got through, uh, got through uh, respiration. Uh, the sugars, we got through digestive system. But we're noticing that we're left with two molecules that we need to deal that are produced as a byproduct of this process. This is going to be our carbon dioxide and then of course our family or good old friend water molecule. So let's have a look of that a little bit that what can we do with them or about. So I'm just going to rewrite them on this side of the screen so that we have space to work through this process. And um, we're going to have a few options of what to do. Uh, we can breathe some of the carbon dioxide away through respiration, uh, but typically we don't transport these byproducts of metabolism um, and in this form in the body. We must kind of convert them into something else. And one of the things that we can do is to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. And we see the uh, formula for that there nicely. And often we use the uh, carbonic acid as a step that we can convert even further. And notice that I'm drawing the in this diagram, the arrows both ways. So these reactions can go both ways. And the end result that I want us to pay attention is going to be what I'm writing here. So in this case, we're producing and this is not a balanced equation, so uh, keep that in mind. But we're producing hydrogen ion. And we're also producing a bicarbonate molecule. And bicarbonates were the ones that we often use to uh, carry and then get rid of through respiration from, through the lungs. But we are left now with this hydrogen ion and what to do with it. And this is where the urinary system steps in. So urinary system plays an important role for us to remove the excess hydrogen ions from the body. And this is really where the kidneys, the urine formation, uh, and also the urine elimination comes in important. And we're going to see structures such as the kidneys, which do that, that process of filtering blood, removing materials, uh, regulating uh, blood, and then supporting structures such as our ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. So if nothing else, I hope that this short revisiting the cellular respiration diagram shows you how all these systems worked together, how we needed all of the systems. And we've already seen quite a few, and we're going to keep seeing more as we continue the second half of this semester. And uh, really, I guess that the big take home message here that I'm trying to put forward is how important it is for us to uh, appreciate that no system exists on their own, that it's, it's always this interplay of, of the systems that we see. So this slide that I have here is just a really quick kind of a revision or a summary of the important structures that we'll have a look of. So we're going to start with the kidneys and typically we have two of them. That's the major organ. Uh, we're going to be focusing earlier on on this course. I've spoken a lot when we talked about the blood kidneys role in blood pressure regulation, kidneys role in filtering blood. 
Uh, we're also going to see how kidneys uh, regulate the fluid volume and concentration when we look at the, uh, the body fluids chapter on this coming week. And uh, we, of course, saw the role of the red blood cell production regulation and vitamin D synthesis and so on. So there's a lot where kidneys are going to be important for us and why we really need to pay attention to the kidneys. Uh, from the kidneys, the urea uh, urine that we produce, uh, so we carry the urine through the ureters, these little tubes to the urinary bladder. So we're gonna have one ureter for each kidney and one urinary bladder shared for all of the system. Um, really the ureters are not terribly exciting structures from my point of view. They really serve the purpose of transporting the urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. There are few adaptations such as the muscular wall of the ureters that will have a quick look at in just a bit but they're, they're not the most exciting structure. We'll also talk about the urinary bladder. A urinary bladder serves as a temporary storage pouch for the urine that we have produced. And finally, we'll have a look of the urethra uh, with the role of transporting the urine out of the body. So without a further ado, I wanted to just from the kidneys, and I have some highlights that I made during our class that I just decided to keep here. Uh, I wanted to remind us how we've been speaking about the role of really regulating the composition of the blood. Uh, we, for example, saw the erythropoietin and renin, those uh, hormones earlier on when we discussed those as part of our uh, endocrine system chapters uh, playing role in blood pressure regulation and red blood cell production regulation. But there's a whole lot of other things that kidneys are really important for, uh, regulating the total water volume, solute concentrations, iron concentrations, uh, acid base balance, which is really what we'll have a look on the uh, body fluids chapter, of course, removing materials, uh, materials that come in these metabolic processes, but also toxins, drugs, many, many other things. We'll see the activation of the vitamin D, uh, if needed, gluconeogenesis as well. Uh, but really, I guess that the take home message here is that there's going to be a rich blood supply to the kidneys because blood, all the blood gets filtered through the kidneys and uh, they play a key role. Uh, they're really the business end of the urinary system. Here I have a few just kind of uh, pointers in preparation for our kidney dissection. Uh, if we look at a kidney, typically they're kind of reddish brown in color, kind of a bean shaped structures. We'll end up seeing this concave medial surface. So regardless on which side we are, the medial facet is going to be concave and the lateral surface is going to be convex. And it is within this medial surface that we'll also see the renal hilum uh, as well. And within the renal hilum, we're going to see uh, not only just the ureter blood, blood vessels, so arteries and veins coming in, leaving the kidney, lymphatic vessels, nerve supply, so a lot of stuff coming in. Uh, one thing that we'll notice when we dissect the kidney is that the surface of the kidney is really smooth because we have this connective tissue capsule around it. Another thing uh, that I've been referring every now and then a structure is peritoneum and we'll get to see peritoneum in a greater extent when we talk about digestive system. But for now, you can just consider peritoneum is a lining that lines the abdominal cavity largely and uh, kidney is described as being retroperitoneal, so behind the peritoneum. 
That brings me to the point that I really wanted to highlight that kidneys are way further towards the back than people often think. So thinking of things like sleeping on a electric blanket that's turned on on a full blast, uh, that could potentially cause issues to the kidneys if you sleep on your back. So uh, just be aware that kidneys are further back than you might intuitively think. Other thing that we notice is that the left kidney is typically located higher than the right kidney, which is located lower. And this is simply due to the location of the liver. So liver taking a lot of the space on the right hand side of the superior abdominal cavity. Of course, we've seen our adrenal gland on top of the kidney as well. I'm not going to go into uh, clinical cases when it comes to the kidneys just yet uh, at this time. So I'll just leave it for you to look at independently. But these structures of the internal kidney anatomy that I wanted to highlight is that just like we had with the brain, we are going to have a cortex of the kidneys. This is the superficial portion of the kidneys. And then within the medulla, which is deeper to the cortex, we're going to see these kind of a triangular or cone shaped structures known as our renal medullas, um, or I mean, our renal pyramids. Uh, between the renal pyramids, we're also going to see renal columns. Um, and finally, I think I did mention about the renal pelvis, this funnel shaped structure that then carried the urine that we're producing down the ureter uh, as it leaves the kit. Uh, we're going to see major and minor calluses uh, as we study the more of the internal structure of the uh, renal pelvis. So I don't think that there's anything that got highlighted that we wouldn't have discussed. But uh, really, I don't think that kidney chapter is terribly exciting or the urinary system chapter terribly exciting or new stuff for many of you. But uh, what I do want to do is uh, take a, just a moment to talk about the structural and also the uh, functional key structure of the um, of the the uh, urinary system and this is going to be our nephew so let's just jump back there and if you really wanted to think about it um you can kind of characterize nephron as the uh, key business and the structural functional unit that conducts the business of what we're really trying to do with the urinary system, which was all those functions that we saw earlier on. And um, what we're going to do now, we're going to draw a nephron together because I think it's going to be useful for us to uh, highlight the key structures, not just from a diagram, but for you to join me of sketching it out. Before we do, I do want to just share with you. Uh, students often wonder about the nephrons. How many nephrons would you expect to see? So in a healthy adult, we're looking somewhere between 0.8 to 1.5. 5 million nephrons per kidney. So even though this is a tiny, tiny, tiny structure, it is a very, very numerous structure as well uh, to conduct all of the business that we've assigned for it. And what we're going to do when we're drawing a nephron, we're going to start with the blood supply that's going to be coming to the nephron. So we're going to see here uh, blood coming to this direction. And this is going to be our afferent arterioli. So smaller than an artery, uh, a little bit bigger than a capillary. And um, we're also going to see efferent arterioli. Efferent arterioli carries the blood away from this structure. And one interesting adaptation that we're going to keep seeing is that this efferent arterioli is running along around where we will see uh, our uh, other nephron structures. 
So that's that's something that you just keep on the mind for now. And we'll have a look of that in a little bit more detail. I just made a little change. I wanted to make it a little more prominent uh, and longer downwards on this diagram. So that's why I kind of re-sketched it. So this was going to be our efferent leaving the structure. And in between of these two, we're going to see a capillary network. And this capillary network is really the business end where we're exchanging material from the blood to the nephron itself. And um, this capillary has sometimes a few different names that we use. Um, I think that the name that your textbook will show you is going to be our glomerulus. So let's add that just as a label there that we can come back. But uh, glomerulus itself is not going to be existing on its uh, mighty uh, isolation. If you think of the capillary tuft, the glomerulus as this fist that I'm showing here, around it is going to be wrapped a structure, and this structure is going to be our glomerular capsule. So it wraps all the sides except from the very top around the glomerulus. For the sake of making our life a little bit easier, I'm going to draw it as if it were cut uh, or sectioned in half. So you're going to see a kind of a cross section of the uh, glomerular capsule. So don't let that throw you off. It's going to be encircling and closing completely this glomerulus. Uh, we're just simplifying it for the purposes of making this drawing it a little easier. So that was going to be our glomerular capsule. Sometimes you might see glomerular capsule also being referred as Bowman's capsule after the uh, gentleman who first described it in full. So both names can be used, but we're referring with the both names to this very, very same structure around the glomerular. From the glomerular capsule, we're going to see a tube coming out. And this tube is actually uh, kind of a little bit wiggly, if you wish to use that word. So it has twists and turns and nooks. Um, and that's going to be important because that gives us more surface area uh, for the processes that will take place there. So let's just label that as well. And that's going to be our proximal convoluted tubule. And if we're going to have a proximal convoluted tubule, we're also going to have a distal convoluted tubule. So let's add that as well to our diagram. The proximal refers to the fact that it's closer to what we saw here, close to the glomerular capsule. So that's proximal, and then we're going to have this distal one, which is uh, a little bit further away. So we're telling the difference between these two simply with this nomenclature that we're using. So that was our distal convoluted tube. 
And connecting these two is going to be a thinner tube that we'll see. And in reality, this tube would be much longer for the sake of keeping our diagram simple. I'm just showing it a little bit shorter. And this is going to be our nephron loop. Or another name that we sometimes see being called for that is Loop of Henley. Again, referring to the gentleman who played important role in description of this structure. And finally, the last part that I want to add to this diagram is going to be a tube or a duct that collects the secretions from multiple nephrons. So it's not just from this nephron, but from many, many, many nephrons. And this is going to be our collecting duct. So collecting ducts then join together and carry more material, more material towards what you remember was the renal pelvis. So they really kind of help us to add together these secretions from different nephrons. And these are really the anatomical parts that I wanted us to be certain of or comfortable of as we're studying the structure of the nephron. There is going to be a couple of things to notice that we haven't yet really probably paid enough attention. And the first one of these is going to be this blood vessel that's going to be running right next to the nephron. And that's going to become important in little bit when we start to look at actually the physiology, what happens within the nephron. So just bear in mind, there's going to be this blood vessel very, very close to the nephron itself. Uh, so that's going to be important as it helps us to understand a lot more about the physiology and physiological processes that take place. And let's have a look of those together. I'm just finishing off this sketching around the structures that we did to make it stand out a little bit, because we're going to use this very same diagram to add also the physiology, uh, as I said, uh, that's going to be important when we look at what happens at the neck. And the first step that we'll end up seeing happening is going to be here, the movement of fluids from the blood to the nephron itself at our glomerulus and the glomerular capsule that surrounded the glomerulus. This process is going to be known as our filtration. So we're filtering the blood, uh, removing materials from the blood and uh, putting them to the nephron. So that was the first step of these movements of fluids that we end up seeing. The second step of movements of fluids that we'll end up seeing is going to happen now at the nephron loop, and it's going to be the movement of materials away from the nephron loop to the blood vessel that's going around it. And this is going to be known as our reabsorption. And you can think of it in a way that now we've gone through all this trouble of moving materials from the blood to the nephron, but we might realize that not all of that should have moved that way. So we can reabsorb, take back some of those contents to the blood at this level. 
at this stage. The next stage is actually going to be interestingly opposite of that at the nephron loops more distal portion. So now we're moving material back from the blood to the nephron itself. And this process is going to be our, called, known as our secretion. So let's add that as well to our little diagram that we sketched together. And the final step, so you see how we have chances to make a decision and then go backwards on that decision and then come to uh, some sort of uh, come back and forth. So we have multiple extra steps, multiple mechanisms. I often talk when we talk about the end, how does the future look like uh, for each system as we age? And I often say that it doesn't look great. Things get more challenging. Well, in case of the urinary system, we're kind of over engineered. So we end up actually having a fairly well functioning urinary system, even late to the late age as we uh, go up with the age. So uh, that's why we have these multiple steps to change our mind. The final step that we're gonna see is gonna be the final product. So our urine that we put out. So uh, what gets put into the collecting duct? as a result of this process. So that's our final step when we look at this physiology side of the story of a nephron and how nephron functions. So uh, I hope that that helped you to make a little bit of sense out of this structure. And just a couple of things that I want to highlight um, outside. Uh, what we just looked at, I have a little bit of a prettier drawing, uh, still showing the same things, never mind the colors, the red and blue, that's not quite accurate. I just wanted to emphasize something, but that's not quite uh, accurate for our purposes. So we see our afferent and efferent arterioli. We see how they run really close to the nephron structure itself. Uh, we see our glomerulus, which was the capillary tuft. And we see the glomerular capsule around that, sometimes also known as a Bowman's capsule. Uh, leaving from the glomerular capsule is going to be our uh, proximal convoluted tubule. But before that, the process of filtration, so taking the material away from the blood into the nephron. That's going to be our filtrate the material. Uh, like I said, the proximal convoluted tubule, then our nephron loop or loop of Henle, if you wished. And this was the second stage of the movement of materials. In this case, the reabsorption of materials from the nephron to the blood. Uh, and the, following that, the process of secretion from the blood to the nephron, also at the loop of Henle or nephron loop. We had our distal convoluted tubule and our collecting duct. And the final product that we ended up seeing was the, uh, was the urine as a result of excretion that we made. So all of these structures added to this diagram, I hope you found it useful for us to draw it together, though. Uh, but I wanted to show it also in, in kind of a more of a standard way that you used to see the illustrations from me and also those functional events that we had a look of that I've shown here. So filtration, reabsorption, secretion and excretion. One of the concepts that we will end up seeing when we talk about nephron is a measure known as glomerular filtration rate, often abbreviated as GFR. Glomerular filtration rate is actually a numerical measure to establish how much blood passes through the glomeruli in each minute. Basically, why it's important is that it tells us how well the kidneys work. 
So if you have too low of a glomerular filtration rate, we cannot use certain drugs, we wouldn't be able to use certain contrast agents uh, in medical imaging and so on. So we want to have a sufficient GFR value. Another thing that's nice to highlight with the nephron is the concept of ADH. You remember the hormone, antidiuretic hormone that we discussed uh, when we discussed our endocrine system. What ADH does, it turns the distal convoluted tubule more permeable. So now material is able to leave the nephron and return black back to the circulation. So essentially it inserts that we do not end up losing material uh, fluids if we're wanting to preserve fluids in the body. So that's, that's how the ADH acted. And I always feel that only now we're starting to get the second half of the story, uh, since we never got a chance to talk in great extent about that when we discussed about the, urinary, uh, about the endocrine system. So the final three structures that I want us to have a look of are ureter, bladder, and urethra. Uh, before that, I do want to say a few words about the urine. Urine mainly made of water, about 95%, remaining 5% different solutes, most common ones being our urea, uric acid, and creatine. We do end up seeing a bunch of other normal solutes, and we'll have a look of that in the loop. Uh, what we might have issues with is if there's too high or too low concentration of something that should be there. Uh, if we find any abnormal components, components that shouldn't be in the urine, and good examples of that would be, uh, for example, blood, whether it's red blood cells, that would indicate that there's an, somewhere an injury within the urinary tract, or white blood cells. Uh, that, remember, told us about an infection somewhere. Um, but let's have a look at the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra just quickly. So ureters are these uh, about 25 centimeters long tubes made of smooth muscle that carry the urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. What's interesting is that this smooth muscle uh, structure allows the ureters to do something known as peristalsis. By peristalsis, I mean this synchronized contraction that it proceeds like a wave, so it pushes the urine onwards within the tube. And we see an example of that when we think of, for example, astronauts in zero gravity, or even if you were standing on your head, the urine would still move from the kidneys to the urinary bladder, even against the gravity. That's the uh, thanks to this uh, smooth muscle lining of the ureters. Uh, again, retroperitoneal structure behind the peritoneal. Um, at the urinary bladder level, I do want to point out that the ureters join the urinary bladder actually from the base. So from the bottom, not as we often see in other diagrams. And this opening from the base results that there's actually going to be three tubes that are opening. So the two ureters and one urethra. Ureter is more posterior, urethra more anterior, and they form this triangular structure known as trigon. Trigon is going to be an important structure if you end up doing medical imaging, for example, and going to this area. A urinary bladder is really not much more uh, that we see there than this hollow uh, sac that uh, can stretch, made of muscular walls of the smooth muscle. We also see detursor muscle there uh, that really store, stores the urine when we're ready to until we're ready to release it. Uh, resting on the pelvic floor, again, a retroperitoneal structure. Um, there is a difference between the urethra, between males and females, that plays an important role in uh, spreading of infections to the urinary bladder. And we'll see an example of that in a second. I do want to say about the urethra, that's just a tube that drained the urine from the bladder to the external word. Again, a muscular tube. We're going to see different kinds of sphincters there. And when we talk about the urinary tract infections, notice for the male urethra how long it is, whereas female urethra is much shorter. And this leads into the fact 
uh, it's much easier for infections to make their way to the urinary bladder in a female anatomy than in a male anatomy. So UTIs are going to be more common amongst females. Uh, the word that I wanted to highlight here is the word micturition, referring to the process of urinating. Uh, and that's going to kind of wrap up. What I wanted to say when it comes to our review of the uh, urinary system in terms of the lecture material. I also show in a classroom an interesting video where we see actually a clinical procedure uh, of a removal of bladder stones. So I will link it to the end of this video because it's not my property it's someone who else who deserves credit for that but have a look of that if you're interested it's actually rather dramatic uh, in a classroom i don't highlight it i can tell it a little later but the video is actually going to be uh, from a procedure on a horse because horses actually do have a lot of calcium in their diet and uh that's why the formation of the kidney or bladder stone is more likely if horse gets a kidney or bladder infection, the derby can act as uh, as a focus for the calcium and start calcium cells start to precipitate out and over a long period of time could cause a bladder stone to form. Uh, these are quite rough and jagged cause the trauma and cause the trauma to the bladder, which then leads to bleeding of the bladder wall and blood in the horse's urine so uh, you can have a look of that video from the end of this one i'll just leave it for you to visit independently what i do want to do instead is to share just quickly another uh, review with you so uh, what I wanted to share was the review kind of of our lecture uh, of our lab material. Of course, for the lab, there is an expectation that you would be present. Uh, otherwise, you cannot really do the dissection part. Uh, and same goes for the analysis of the urine. Uh, but. I want to offer at least a chance for some of you to gain some of those points if if you want to attempt the urine analysis. Uh, so let's have a look of that. And like I said, this is going to be divided in two different parts. Um, the half of the points for this week's lab are simply going to be from participation to the kidney dissection act. The remaining for completion of the urine analysis uh, worksheet, which is what I'm expecting to get submitted back to me. So let's have a look of the urine analysis first. Um, urine is formed for multiple reasons, and we saw earlier on the blood composition regulation, removal of waste products, and so on. Uh, really, to use urine and analyzing that is clinically kind of an attractive option for us. It's easy to get. It's not invasive. It's a fairly quick uh, way of testing things. We can analyze multiple uh, things such as, for example, composition, volume, gravity, color, transparency, even smell of the urine to tell whether someone's doing okay or not. Well, uh, what you get typically from a lab is a, a report, but we can actually do the, some of the basic tests ourselves uh, as well. In, in uh, with a, just a simple dipstick uh, analysis, which is what you completed in this lab. Normal urine is typically kind of a pale yellow clear. pH can vary quite a bit from 4.5 all the way to 8, typically somewhere around 6. Uh, remember, urine is sterile, so there's no issue in terms of that, uh, especially for this lab and collecting your own urine. We do expect to see certain elements in the urine in certain amounts. Uh, you remember largely water and then other solutes. Great way of seeing certain things like, for example, hormones, early pregnancy tests rely on that as well. Uh, what we don't expect to see in urine is uh, urine to be very dark. 
dark, they're very concentrated or cloudy. Uh, we don't expect to see certain elements in it. That could be a concern. So a really, really simple, quick way for us to test a lot of things. So what you concluded or completed in the class was a simple dipstick analysis where we use a stick that has chemically been treated with various different kinds of pads and each of these coated pads uh, included different reagents and that respond different ways when uh, when exposed to a sample of a urine. So what I asked you to do is to was to collect a sample of urine and uh, then we performed analysis from that. I also provided synthetic urine for those who were just too shy to do the, do the deed themselves. And then we completed the chart together. And that's what I'm going to be helping you a little bit with. Um, in terms of the lab and the results, I'm looking for you to have these results for your own urine analysis. Uh, but things that kind of help you to lead to what we are actually looking, we're looking things like turbidity, which tells us about how clear or cloudy the urine is. We're looking for the presence of white blood cells. Remember, if there were white blood cells, that could be a problem. We're looking whether there's proteins present in the urine. Small amount of proteins would not be a concern to me, but excess uh, amounts definitely. Uh, we're looking of the pH of the urine. Remember, pH was a direct measure of the hydrogen. Uh, ion concentration and uh, the range varied quite a bit and diet can play important role in your urine of your ur urine pH and so on. But, but it's, it's an important measure that we can look at. We can look at whether there's red blood cells, white blood cells present. Those could be a problem. We're looking for hemoglobin as well. We're looking for ketones. Uh, ketones are produced uh, during the fatty acid metabolism, and they would lower also the blood's pH. We should not find ketones in the urine. So you'll see a lot of the time we have multiple things looking for same things, so slightly different tests. So we're looking for a general idea, not just one of the items standing out. The uh, presence of glucose is interest uh, for us as well. We should not normally find glucose in the urine because it should be all reabsorbed. So the question in the lab shirt worksheet was why would glucose in the urine be considered abnormal where we should not see glucose under the normal circumstances uh, because it does get fully reabsorbed in the kidneys, but diabetes would be a good example when we end up finding high blood glucose concentration and finding glucose also remaining in the urine. The next question looked at uh, blood in the urine. And again, normally the filtration membrane pores, they're too small for the red blood cells to fit through. So if we end up finding blood or hemoglobin in the urine, that's probably an indication that there's some sort of damage to the filtration membrane or somewhere else along the urinary tract. So that would be a concern. Uh, I also asked about the protein in urine, and again, the pores typically are too small for the proteins to sneak through, uh, but if we do find protein in the urine, that's, that's an indication that there's a damage probably for this filtration membrane, known as a condition of protein urea. Uh, and finally, I asked about the leukocytes in the urine, and why would that be an issue? Well, leukocytes are part of those white blood cells that we do, used as an indication of some sort of an infection taking place. So another thing that we can be checking for. So uh, I hope that that helps you and guides you a little bit as you tackle the lab. Uh, like I said, I can't really give you points for con completing the kidney dissection lab, but I do want to offer, if you didn't take part, 
but I do want to offer at least a chance to see what we were looking. Of course, I always start with the safety notice. We want to be careful in our labs. And we're going to look at first external appearance of the kidney, then internal structures. I was asking you to find the renal artery and renal vein and ureter uh, at, at the kidney. Remember, on the medial side, the kidneys that we were using were larger, la rather large, I believe, pig kidneys. And a uh, good clue for finding these is also finding the uh, adipose tissue around uh, around. Uh, I asked you to cut the kidney in half lengthwise in half, uh, so we can see the internal structures, including the cortex. So the outermost layer, uh, when we look inside, just like you had cortex of the brain, and uh, this contains a lot of blood vessel vasculature. I think we had triple injected kidneys, so uh, some of those vessels were very visible nicely, uh, carrying the blood to and from the nephrons. Uh, we also saw the medulla, which is the inner parts, and from the medulla, uh, especially the renal pyramids, so these triangular zones. Uh, this includes, for example, the collecting ducts and also the renal columns between the renal pyramids. Uh, this is where we find a lot of mid-sized arteries and veins that carry blood between nephrons and renal artery and vein. Finally, uh, I asked you to notice the renal pelvis, this hollow area at the very center. There we'll see various different kinds of collecting ducts that then uh, collect the urine that passes down the ureter. So, uh, really, the important thing was not just to see the anatomy, but also look at the physiology, follow the path of blood, and follow the path of the filtrate. And in your handout that I provided for you, I actually went a little crazy and prepared a rather nice summary of the flow of the blood for you in case you were interested about that, that you can refer to as well. Uh, but I think that this was a fun dissection. Many of you enjoyed, especially seeing that triple injection. Uh, so I hope that you found it useful. As always, if you missed handing in anything, uh, I am fairly flexible of accepting the late work. Make sure you do get it in, though, because we want you to get all those points that you deserve. And that really completes my part for reviewing this. Uh, like I said, I'm sorry we didn't get to do this uh, in a live setting, but at least this way you do have a copy of a review session for your convenience as well. And until next time we see, I'm going to wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you again for joining.